Action Kappa Delta Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation Award, Russell Hibbs Award, Arthur Hyde Memorial Award, a Lifetime Award, which is called Alfred, Alfred Shantz Award, Award for Outstanding Leadership in Orthopedics from the Academy, American Orthopedic Association, Distinguished Contributors to Orthopedics Award, and so on, many more. And as I was looking through all these awards, the most recent one I found came up in JBGS again, another award in November 2015, Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation Clinical Research Award. So it's highly decorated and well-known and well-respected, not only in the U.S., but all around the world. So for us and me in here, it's a, it's a privilege and honor to have you here and to share your experience, your lifelong work on DDH and uh, just humbly to get to know what you have to tell us. Please come on the stage. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and Professor Siebenrock, it's really a, an honor to be here. I've learned so much from all of you the last two days. Uh, I hope I have something to contribute. Um, I think that um, I'm going to talk about the evidence base for the current treatment of pediatric uh, orthopedic surgery uh, in relation to DDH. And please remember that my lens is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I'm looking at the hip from birth to maturity, and many of you are looking at it after maturity. And some of the things I say, well, you might say, well, you already knew that, but you have to realize that the journey I'm going to describe began for me back in 1973, and we didn't know that, things I'm going to tell you at that point in time. These are my conflicts of interest. So the story actually begins in 1913 when our department was founded, and the first chairman was a man named Arthur Steindler. Steindler was a product of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and he did his orthopedic training in Vienna under Adolf Lorenz and became very skilled at manipulative treatment of DDH, which would carry him to his uh, work in the United States. When he founded our department in 1913, he instilled the system of education, which still exists today in 2016, where every resident needs to know the pathoanatomy of a condition, what's its natural history, and what's the impact of treatment on that natural history to see how we're making patients better. The history also is influenced by one of Steindler's pupils, and that's Ignacio Ponsetti, who came to the University of Iowa in 1941. Dr. Ponsetti was born in Menorca as a Catalan, fought, he was educated in Barcelona, and fought in the Spanish Civil War and then eventually came to Mexico and to the United States. Well, one of Dr. Ponsetti's teacher was a man named Joseph, Tru Joseph Trueta at the University of Barcelona. He was also his commander in the Spanish Civil War. And then, as many of you know, he became professor at Oxford uh, after uh, the war. Both Dr. Wenger and I trained at the University of Iowa, and I think Dr. Wenger would admit, too, that he's profoundly influenced by the time at Iowa and Dr. Ponsetti. And I had the great privilege of working with him for 36 years, uh, first as my mentor, then as my colleague and friend. Now, this story wouldn't be possible without the amazing record-keeping system that was started by Steindler. Brilliant man, spoke seven languages, and was an amazing, amazing scientist of his day, even in 1913. And he had a stable and loyal population, which I've been able to tap into my whole life. So as I talk to you about my lifetime experience studying DDH, I have to appreciate that this wouldn't be possible without the groundwork that was laid by Steinler first and Ponsetti secondly. And the majority of the things I talk about will have been done research at the University of Iowa, though others certainly have contributed similar um, papers and research projects as well. So first, starting with normal growth and development of the hip and also the pathoanatomy of DDH. I think you know that Dr. Ponsetti wrote a seminal paper in the late 70s which described the normal growth and development of the hip joint, particularly the acetabulum. And in the acetabulum, there's the, cartilage comp the acetabular cartilage complex. And the outer two-thirds 
is the acetabular cartilage. The medial one-third is filled by the pulvinar, and the head doesn't actually articulate with it. But you can see the triradiate cartilage there, both in the cartoon and in actuality. And the triradiate cartilage, remember, is the common physeal plate of the three pelvic bones. The diameter of the acetabulum is determined by interstitial growth within the triradiate cartilage. And then Benson and the group from Oxford in the uh, picture on the right looked at the differential growth rates of the triradiate cartilage. So again, this gives you the diameter of the hip. But the concave shape of the hip is determined by what's in it, in most cases a spherical femoral head. And the development of the acetabulum is determined by what's in it. So this is really important if you have growth disturbances of the upper end of the femur early in life. It's important in other hip diseases like Perthes disease or septic arthritis. Now, normal acetabular depth is dependent upon several factors as well. You need to have appositional growth under the perichondrium for new cartilage cells generation and interstitial growth within the acetabular cartilage as well. Also, normal growth and development of the acetabulum requires a very delicate balance between the three pelvic bones, ilium, ischium, and pubis. And this is a specimen from the collection of Dr. John Siegling at the University of Chicago, and this child ingested phosphorized cod liver oil. And you can see the differential growth rates of the bones. You can see the upper end of the ilium is growing about two and a half times faster than the distal end. You can see the portion by the triradiate cartilage is a little bit faster than the acetabular cartilage adjacent to it. And lastly, the depth is enhanced by the development of three secondary ossification centers that appear near the adolescent growth spurt, one in the ilium, one in the ischium, and one in the pubis. Here you can see what's called the acetabular epiphysis. And you can see that if this didn't develop, your surceal would be flat or horizontal. So these are critical for the depth development of the acetabulum. Another important fact to remember is that the majority of acetabular shape is determined in the child by eight years of age. And once again, to emphasize, the shape of the acetabulum is determined by what's in it during growth. So growth disturbances, the upper end of the femur, regardless of the cause, have a profound influence on the shape of the acetabulum. On the femoral side, you know that at birth, there's a single chondral epiphysis. And as the child ages in the uh, figures in the lower left and lower right, you have differentiation of differ different growth plates, which affect the shape of the upper end of the femur. So the lower picture on your left might be a toddler, might be a child in the age of Perthes disease, and the lower right is near the end of growth when the child might have a slipped epiphysis, for example. And remember that those of us who do children's orthopedics, that we can profoundly damage the upper end of the femur by the treatments we do, whether it be closed treatment or open treatment. And this can result in a growth disturbance, which hence could have a secondary effect on what the acetabulum looks like in those children later, later in life. Our gold standard is this. You have a beautifully developed down sloping surceal. You have a very thin, beautiful teardrop you can see in different positions here. You have the gothic arch, the stress lines above the hip, and this gives the patient the best chance of having a normal hip throughout life, though obviously genetics plays a factor as well. Now in DDH, the majority of the pathology is on the acetabular side. On the femoral side, you just have varying degrees of anaversion and you have what other deformities might occur from the femoral head being pressed against the ilium or the lateral acetabulum. So you have some inherent deformities depending on the height of the dislocation, the length of time it was dislocated, or uh, other adaptive changes. But the majority of pathology is on the acetabular side. And on the acetabulum in DDH, you have this ridge of cartilage that's in the superior, posterior, and inferior aspect. And it's over this ridge that the femoral head glides in and out to give you the Ornolani sign. One of our fellows in the late 80s, who later was a professor in uh, Japan, we did arthrograms on cadavers and on all of our open reductions and correlated arthrograms with operative findings. And I'll come back to that later on. But one key feature I want to highlight now is this peripheral acetabular tissue. The peripheral acetabulum 
in Ortolani's time, he called this the neolimbus or the false limbus. If you take biopsies of the uh, neolimbus in the periphery of the acetabulum and, and also a biopsy from the triradiate cartilage and histochemically stain it, they all should look like the lower left picture. That's what it should look like. But in all the specimens we studied, that peripheral tissue looks like the lower right. The cells are irregular in size, shape, and arrangement, and they stain unevenly. Now, most likely, they're not primarily this way. Most likely, this is a traumatic uh, changes from the femoral head pressing against the peripheral acetabulum uh, and damaging this cartilage. But the important clinical factor is when these children begin to ossify after closed or open reduction, you get the development of these accessory ossification centers. And these accessory ossification centers rarely occur in normal children, but occur in about two-thirds of children with DDH, and they usually appear in the first two or three years after reduction. So you need to look for these after your closed and open reduction, and when you draw your acetabular index, I think you should draw it like the red line here, because those centers will eventually coalesce to form the roof of the acetabulum. Now, what about natural history of DDH? Well, we, like many institutions, had a number of patients who were never treated and have a small series of natural history patients. And there are others in Canada and around the world. But basically, the natural history of DDH depends on whether it's unilateral or bilateral and whether the femoral head articulates with the ilium or not. So in the bilateral case, where the femoral head does not articulate with the ilium, these patients have no pain, but they have a waddling gait and hyperlordosis and get back pain. If the femoral head articulates with the ilium at any point, these patients get disabling degenerative joint disease and require arthroplasty very early in life. And in the unilateral cases, they have valgus deformities of the knee, lateral compartment degenerative joint disease, and possibly secondary scoliosis. Now, what about the natural history of dysplasia, which is somewhat controversial, and what about the natural history of subluxation? I'm going to define dysplasia in two ways. One is anatomic dysplasia, which is anything that's anatomically not normal. And then I'll take radiographic dysplasia, and many of you have contributed to definitions of what radiographic dysplasia is, but in a simplistic form, both of these hips are anatomically dysplastic. The hip on the left is subluxated because Shenton's line is disrupted. The hip on the right is radiographically dysplastic because Shenton's line is intact. And the natural history of subluxation is crystal clear. Every patient with hip subluxation disrupted Shenton's line gets osteoarthritis. The natural history of untreated dysplasia is a little bit murky because we don't know the end in the population, how many patients have dysplasia inherently. But there is very good evidence, and you've heard some of it here, that particularly in females with primary dysplasia, that is a precursor to osteoarthritis in adult life. Well, what about long-term treatment? Does it alter natural history? And one benefit of spending an entire life at your institution, and Dr. Ponsetti spent his entire life at the institution, is that basically when we develop a treatment protocol, it's developed on the best evidence at the time. Then we review the outcomes continuously, and if the outcomes are good, we continue the protocol and see if the outcomes are sustained. If the results are bad, we analyze why, make changes accordingly, <clears throat> look at the evidence that's been contributed since that time, make a new protocol, and follow those patients. And in general, we tend to be one fad behind. We, I would say we're not cutting edge, but we're kind of staying in the back, following our patients, making sure that the changes we make for patient care are justified. So as I talk about closed treatment, remember that Steinler was heavily influenced by Lorenz with the manipulative reductions, closed reductions of DDH. Dr. Wenger was involved in the first follow-up of these patients. This was a 15-year follow-up. And then when I joined the faculty, I continued to follow those patients prospectively and reported a 31-year follow-up of these 152 hips and have finished a 40-plus year follow-up as well of these same patients. Let's look at the outcomes, and we're just going to look at the bad outcomes. And we'll define bad outcomes 
as a Severin three or Severin four, hip dysplasia or hip subluxation. These are the bad outcomes. And if we look at this long-term group of patients treated by closed reduction, and you continue the follow-up, you can see that as we follow the patients longer and longer, the dysplastic hips go on to subluxation and osteoarthritis. So the next question we wanted to answer is why, so we, we know that now we can never accept in patients with DDH, we can never accept dysplasia and obviously we can never accept subluxation. The next question we wanted to answer is why do dysplastic hips get osteoarthritis? And this is a classic example of a patient who we thought was doing great at age 17, but you can see how the patient goes on to deterioration. It was my experience, and I'm sure many of you as well in the room, is that every patient I went to do a Salter or Pemberton osteotomy was perfectly well covered by cartilage. And the same in doing PAOs. All the patients, their arthrograms show that they were 90 plus percent covered. But the problem we have is a biologic failure, a failure of ossification, not a failure of coverage. So we kind of thought, well, maybe hips with dysplasia get osteoarthritis very similar to genuvarum and genuvalgum from cartilage overload and increased contact stress over time. So with one of our fellows, Nancy Hadley Miller, we looked at our long-term follow-up patients and we measured contact stress correlated with clinical and radiographic outcomes. And we felt that these patients had they basically had cartilage, peripheral cartilage intolerance. They couldn't tolerate these stresses over time. So with a biomechanics student, uh, Tina Maxian, we evaluated uh, chronic stress tolerance of the articular cartilage and compared it to long-term outcomes. And what we were able to show is that osteoarthritis correlates with the magnitude of overpressure and the time of exposure. Hence, these patients with hip dysplasia get secondary osteoarthritis because of cartilage overload, increased contact stress over time. So if you have a patient like this, and in the center picture, I must admit in the 70s, we thought that was a good result. But obviously, because of uh, articular cartilage intolerance and these um, stresses over time, they go on to subluxation and degenerative joint disease. So I think all of us who do pediatric orthopedics are intervening on the left by doing Salter osteotomies or Pemberton osteotomies to try and improve outcome. And many of you who are in the hip preservation business are doing procedures in early adult life to try and change the results over time by increasing stability, increasing the bony load bearing area. So a review of closed treatment also showed that we had a high incidence of necrosis. In fact, 60% of the closed treatment had a growth disturbance of the upper end of the femur. What happens if you get a growth disturbance? How does outcome affect it? Well, we know that the total head necrosis or type three growth arrests have a disastrous outcome. 90% of them do poorly. 90% of type three growth arrests go on to osteoarthritis. The type two growth arrest has a little different prognosis because these, these valgus tilting of the head, they occur usually 10 to 12 years after treatment. You don't know they're occurring for quite a long time. And so the femoral head has been in good position for acetabular development for a very long time before they start to tilt into valgus. So the outcome of these patients is not so poor. The next question we wanted to answer is, well, how do we avoid aseptic necrosis or proximal femoral growth disturbance? One of our residents did some hydrogen washout and microsphere studies showing that these casting positions were terrible. They interfere with proximal femoral growth uh, blood flow and they should not be used. And these were used in many of the patients treated by Steindler. We evaluated traction. We know that traction over the long term can facilitate reduction, but there's no high level evidence to support the use of traction to prevent proximal growth disturbance. So that was we felt we could abandon. The key factor we felt in growth disturbance might be excessive pressure occluding intercartilaginous vessels on these, these very vascular femoral heads as you can see on the right. So here's where we go, where we go back to Truetta. Truetta in 1960 
and actually Salter around the same time looked at the negative effects of compression on articular cartilage. So we felt that we could no longer accept the principle of just putting the femoral head in the acetabulum and let the femoral head overcome the obstacles to reduction. You may hear people talk about, quote, docking, putting it close and letting it sink in. We felt that we couldn't accept it, and the only reduction we would accept is a perfect anatomic reduction and putting the patient in the human position because that was the most favorable casting position for blood flow to the upper end of the femur. Coming back to this arthrographic study, we determined that all the obstacles to reduction are anteromedial. And therefore, if we had a hip like this that we were trying to close reduction and it wasn't anatomic, if we were going to open the hip, we felt that the classic anterior approach was really not approaching the hip directly over the obstacles to reduction. It's a long way away. You're working down in a hole to try and overcome those obstacles. So in the early 70s, I think some of you may remember Ferguson proposed a medial approach to the hip between the adductor longus and brevis. We didn't find that very satisfactory. So we went back to the literature and found the procedure described by Ludloff, the approach to the hip in 1911, and modified that somewhat, and that's where the obstacles to reduction are. And so we approached the hip in an anteromedial fashion, as you can see here, with excellent visualization. And then Jose Morquende was a resident. He reviewed the first 93 hips I did, and this was an average 11-year follow-up, minimum four-year follow-up, and the aseptic necrosis rate dropped down to 14%. So we came to the realization that a skilled atraumatic open reduction probably has a lower risk to the upper end of the femur than a difficult, unsuccessful closed treatment, just as Dietrich Tonis did as well. And the very last question we uh, answered was, um, Sorry, am I going back here? My apologies. When do we intervene? When do we, how do we prevent unnecessary acetabular femoral surgery? We know that we can never accept dysplasia and subluxation, but how do we ob develop objective measures, qualitative and quantitative, that will help us determine when we should intervene? When, for example, in the upper left picture with a 13-month-old, do we need to do an acetabular procedure or femoral procedure? And how about the patient in the lower left that we're following after closed or open treatment? When do we need to do a Salter, Pemberton, femoral osteotomy, et cetera? So we started by studying the teardrop as a qualitative measure and looked at the teardrop formation and its rotation uh, evaluation on x-rays. And one of our fellows, Javier Albignana from Spain, helped us develop a qualitative measurement of progress of development of the teardrop. And we learned from this study that we could never accept a U or v shaped teardrop. We knew that we were failing and acetabular development would be poor. Secondly, we looked at a quantitative measure for acetabular development after reduction, and we looked at poor results versus the age at reduction. And what we found, that if the child was reduced under a year of age, they had an 85% successful outcome, a good result, a seven, one, or two. At 18 months of age, there was a 70% probability of a good outcome. At two years of age, there's only a 50% probability. And at three years of age, excuse me, only a 30% probability of a good outcome. And lastly, we provided this uh, metric that you could follow your hips after closed or open treatment to see whether you should intervene or not. And if, in a, usually it's the first 18 to 24 months after closed or open treatment are the most important. And if you started to normalize then, you could probably wait a little bit to decide if you need a secondary procedure. So that takes us to the current time. How do we treat DDH at the present time? Well, the majority of DDH detected under one year of age can be managed by closed treatment. Rarely do you need to open a hip. The closer you get to 18 months of age, in the absence of an anatomic reduction, we treat all DDH with an anteromedial approach. Because the probability of having a good outcome is about 70%, we don't do any acetabular procedures at that time. When you get to 24 months of age, however, almost all patients require open treatment. 
all patients, because it's only 50-50 chance of a good outcome, we feel it's worth intervening at that time to do an acetabular procedure. Femoral version will correct at two years of age, but that's probably the upper end that you can expect correction of aniversion. And then when you get closer to three years of age, you need to address all the deformities, both the femoral excessive aniversion, the acetabular dysplasia, and the reduction as well. So as I conclude, I've been really privileged to be part of, a, of an orthopedic heritage at a single institution where critical thinking is the mantra of every person who's ever trained there. We're always asking the question why, we're always asking how can we do this better, have our results been satisfactory for patients, and can we improve on the outcomes by continuous reassessment of our patients. And the tenants of Steinler, who was a very brilliant man who I never knew, who started the department in 1913, really started evidence-based medicine before anyone was even talking about it. So I've been privileged to stand on the shoulders of giants Steinler and Ponsetti and to be able to at least share with you our experience today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Be happy to answer any questions. Thanks.